What's up guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new around here, my name's Uncle Reddit. Actually, even if you're not new around here, my name's Uncle Reddit. And this is r slash malicious compliance. Weekend edition. It's Friday night here, still in Florida, still in the fifth wheel. Uh, everybody's being very cooperative right now and letting me uh, take over the airspace here for a little bit. And I uh, figured we'd get some stories in because I'm going to be on the road tomorrow, Saturday, when you guys will see this. And probably part of Sunday. I'm not going to drive straight through, so yeah, maybe we'll even record something on the road, but we'll see. All right, let's get to it. Landlord tried to exploit me for free labor. I'm renting a little house out past the suburbs of the city I'm currently working in. It's a little old and the appliances are a bit dated, but it was much cheaper than a two-bedroom apartment downtown, and I move around every couple years for work. My landlord lives out of state and doesn't have anyone local, so for the past year and a half I haven't talked to anyone. Just pay my rent on time and keep doing my thing. About four months ago, plumbing issues started popping up and two major appliances decided to give up the ghost. I notified my landlord via email and written letter. I rent a lot and have learned to abide by the exact wording in a lease. After several follow-up emails and phone calls, a local handyman showed up to look at everything and provide a quote. After receiving the quote for parts plus labor, the landlord told me flat out that they will not be paying for the repairs. They said that since I am an engineer, they would allow me to purchase parts, install them, and then deduct the cost of the repairs from my rent payment. They said it was either this or learn to make do. I was not super thrilled at this response. I replied back to them saying if they were willing to deduct my time and cost of the parts from my rent, that I would get started immediately. Thank you very much. They were thrilled to hear it and asked me to send receipts for their records when everything's finished. Great, now to put together all the pieces and get to work. The first step was to file for an LLC with my current state. Next, I set up some cameras and borrowed a GoPro from one of my hiking mates. I was able to document all the repair processes. From me watching YouTube videos of how to do things, to me making multiple runs to the parts store to get that piece I didn't know I needed. Here's the kicker. At my day job, I make over $50 an hour. That's what my time is valued at. The final bill for everything has worked out to be about 12% higher than the quoted costs, and the landlord is very upset. But my lawyer being added to the email chain has kept them very civil. Yeah, don't blame me, OP. I have had deals in the past where I just kind of wanted the landlord, and they were local, close landlords. I wanted them to stay away from me. I just didn't want to deal with them. And a lot of times the easiest way to deal with that is you pay for the parts, I'll install them. As long as it wasn't anything too heavily involved, I would do that. No problem. I, I didn't care. But that sets a bad precedent uh, for most people. You know, they should be willing to pay the labor. It's part of doing the job or be willing to drive down and do the work themselves if they're from out of state. So good for you for getting your time paid for too. Boss lost her bonus. The incident happened about two months ago, but I just learned of the fallout. A little backstory. I'm a home hemodialysis nurse. I train patients and arrange for all their supplies. Beginning of June, I was told to admit a patient ASAP who was moving from out of state, already trained, only needed a home visit, machine, water, and drain installation, and supplies delivered. Plumber was on vacation, which equals no water installation possible for two weeks. Water is essential for pairing dialysate <laughs> dialys that in the end cleans the blood. There's an emergency workaround by buying pre-made dialysate, whatever that word is. No water required. Patient needed 8 times 5 liter bags each treatment. They come two to a box. Patient dialysis 5 days a week. That's 4 boxes each treatment times 5 equals 20 boxes per week. Boss says order them as quickly as possible for 2 weeks. That's 40 boxes of 10 kilograms, 22 pounds. I tell her the shipping cost will be outrageous. Let's order 8 boxes at Express and the rest regular. Nope, she knows better. Okay, I order 40 boxes overnight by air. $1,500 just for shipping. Oh, man. Supplier thinks that's crazy. I think that's crazy. Boss says do it. End of July, they're checking the budget, and lo and behold, we spent way too much. Less than a third left for the rest of the year. Boss's bonus depends on smart budgeting. She didn't get her bonus this quarter. She was pissed. I feel so vindicated. Yeah, I don't understand. I mean, again, middle management making these weird decisions, thinking that they're all high and mighty and costing themselves and the company a lot of extra money that they didn't need to spend. 
but hey, they know better, right? We comply with neighbor's parking rules, which would cause him more problems than us. I would say that this is a minor case of malicious compliance, but it still felt good. This situation happened a couple years ago when I would meet up at a friend's house every Monday evening to play board games with him and a now married couple. We're going to say that the friend's name is Matt. Matt lives in one of those neighborhoods where the houses are really close together and there are a million cars parked on the street. One evening, we were wrapping up for the night and just chatting when we heard a knock at the door. It was the neighbor across the street, and he was very upset that someone had parked in front of his house because that spot belonged to him. The car belonged to the married couple who quickly apologized and said they were leaving shortly. They rushed to get their things together so they could move the car and avoid conflict. However, I had a different reaction. I thought it was extremely rude for him to knock on our door and demand us to move. I told the neighbor that there were no assigned or claimed spots and that you could park wherever you wanted. Obviously, you park in front of your own house or the house that you're visiting if you can, but otherwise just park wherever there's an available spot. He didn't seem to have a good counter to my argument, but still continued to argue that he didn't want us to park in front of his house. Most houses on the street have enough room for one street parked vehicle on one side of their driveway, while the other side was often unusable due to it being too close to the neighbor's driveway. Best case scenario, on the shorter side, you would have a small spot that would be partially in front of both houses. Due to the odd shape of Matt's lot, which was narrow in the back and wider in the front, he had a lot more space in front of his house on one side than most other houses, enough for three cars. This is where the malicious compliance comes in. The married couple gets into their car and leaves, complying with the neighbor's wishes. Matt decides to give in as well and plays along with the neighbor's rules. He points to the three vehicles nearby and asks, Whose cars are these and why are they parked in front of my house? The neighbor looked dumbfounded and after a moment of silence he admits that two of those vehicles belong to his family. Matt replies, So according to your rules you shouldn't be parking in front of my house. The neighbor looked stunned as his rules were actually going to hurt him much more than they would hurt us. Not only had to worry about his and his roommate's car, which would both fit in his driveway, he only needed street parking when people would occasionally come over. The neighbor had a full driveway and three plus cars on the street that he needed spots for on a daily basis. He didn't have enough street space that would clearly belong to him using his rules. The neighbor walked away in defeat, but apparently argued more with Matt after I left. The pandemic hit shortly after and we canceled our in-person game nights, and I'm pretty sure the neighbor continued to park in front of the other people's houses which is what everyone else does there anyway. Oh, parking, street parking, gotta love it. So, my sister, <laughs> we used to go visit there. My mom and sister shared a house, and they had a psycho neighbor who owned every inch of the street that lined up with her property lines, in her mind. And, uh, yeah, and she had a giant driveway, but she, she didn't really seem to like to park in it much. I think she, well, she did. She parked in her driveway until one of us would park in the street like crossing the, the property line when you're looking at a house property front to back or totally in front of her house or anything like that. She'd come out and bump her car right up into yours or move her trash cans out into the street and, you know, like slam them against the back of your car. Brush piles. She loved piling brush piles up against your car. And uh, just totally, it was a daughter and mother and they were, they both should have been heavily medicated and watched more closely. Yeah. You want the unripe bananas? Okay then. Not sure if this is petty or malicious, but here we go. Years ago, when I was in my early 20s, I worked in an ice cream shop that also made smoothies and shakes. One day, a lady asked for a banana smoothie. So I started to make it and I grabbed the lovely super ripe bananas that were perfect for a smoothie. That lady saw me grab the bananas and said she didn't want those ones because they had brown patches. I told her they were perfect for a smoothie and would give it lots of banana-y flavor. She insisted she didn't want them and I had to use the other bananas even though they had a tinge of green. So I made it for her. I did tell her the bananas weren't ripe properly and it wouldn't taste very nice, but she really didn't want me to use the bananas with some brown on the skins. I gave her her drink and she paid and left. She came back a few minutes later saying the smoothie was disgusting and asked me to remake it with the ripe bananas. I told her I would, but I would be charging her for it because I had warned her. She refused to pay and left with her subpar banana smoothie. Who in their right mind doesn't understand that an underripe banana tastes totally different than a ripe banana? Um, in fact, smoothies, I think a really overly ripe banana, like totally brown skin, works great in a smoothie because it, you know, there's a lot more sugars and things like that. But oh, people are just nuts. They want what they want, what they think they want. 
consequences be damned, I guess. Please CC the boss on all emails. Our company's owner is a great guy, but can be ornery. Last week he was complaining how he rarely gets emails anymore and would like to be included in messages to department heads. QR head accountant, at first including him in just invoices, is now sending all chat messages through email. What's for lunch? CC the boss. There's cake in the break room. CC the boss. Now everyone is clued in, sending memes, lunch coupons, etc. Our boss has been out of the office this week and we get a message this morning. If I get one more unnecessary email, I'm destroying the ice machine. My supervisor replies with a minion meme. <laughs> yeah, the boss was feeling left out so wanted to be included. I don't think he understood just how included he was going to be. Yes, I'll make you coffee, father. This happened years ago, but it's still one of my favorite stories. When I was around 13 or 14, I had a cousin that is one year older than me and really close to my father. One time when he was staying with us, my father and him thought it was funny asking me to bring things to them because I was a girl. Unfortunately for my father, my mother didn't raise no submissive girl, so when he asked me to make some coffee for them, I happily obliged. In my house, it's common to have the coffee be made with sugar already, so people usually wouldn't add it themselves, but this specific day I accidentally confused sugar with salt. Lots of it, like seawater salty coffee. When they came for coffee, I just sat back and watched them spill the coffee. My father just looked at me and I gave him a cloth to clean the mess and said something in the lines of, you never asked for coffee with sugar, and left. He never said anything, but never did that again. But, the worst part was I didn't throw away the coffee in the pot, and a few minutes later, my uncle that was completely innocent and unaware of what was happening, came to ask me why the coffee tasted funny. I did feel bad for him. Yeah, I guess it's different when you're in a house and people do things for each other. Um, you know, if people are asking you to do something, uh, chores and favors and whatever, just because you're a girl, that's completely out of line. But, uh, yeah, that must have been a shock getting that mouthful of salty coffee. <laughs> no smartphones allowed. I've been working with an automotive assembly plant for the past two years. My job is to coordinate the breakdown maintenance work corrective jobs and maintenance work requests on the plant. If you ever worked in a maintenance job on site, you know how it is. On some days there's like no work at all and some days the work will test your nerves. Most of the corrective maintenance I coordinate with different departments and shops is through WhatsApp groups. I created WhatsApp groups with every shop team leaders and my team and whenever there is an issue my team gets a message with the problem described by the production staff and then they attend to it immediately. The facility is pretty big and complex and you definitely need phones to find someone if a maintenance breakdown occurs. Smartphones were allowed communication until the new admin manager joined. The new admin manager within a week sent an email on Saturday. The facility is off on weekends and most of the preventive activities are carried out. That as per company policy and to protect the company trade secrets, no smartphone is allowed on the site except for managers. I called my manager after reading the email and told him that please allow phones for maintenance staff. But he said he can't do crap about the decision and I have to follow what management decides. Actually, he also said that you can't challenge the company policy and will oblige like others. I said okay and hung up. Here comes my malicious compliance. I took the screenshot of the email and sent it to all my team on WhatsApp and that, as smartphones are no more allowed, you all are requested to leave your phones in your lockers. On Monday morning, all of the system is started again and usually the corrective complaints are high on most of the Mondays. I asked my maintenance team of every shop to continue the preventive maintenance activities as per plan and attend the complaints when somebody from production approaches them. I also left my phone in my office drawer and left for a visit on the plant. When I was on rounds, someone from production staff saw me. They approached and described their problem and I told them every time that someone from the team will be there soon, but no one did as team was scattered around the plant. The whole day the team attended only problems they saw or were informed of in person. The result? Breakdown time percentage rose from 0.5% to 16% in one production phase, 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. I came to the office at 12 p.m. after I visited every shop and my manager asked where the heck I've been as he's been calling my phone for hours and there's chaos on the production floor. I showed him my dirty greasy hands and that I've been personally attending many complaints from different shops and didn't even sit for one minute. I reminded him, sir, phones are no more allowed on the production floor. That's why the complaints attendance time skyrocketed. He was speechless, 
and he left. The whole day went like hell for production staff in almost all shops, and in the next morning, the presentation by maintenance was without any pictures, pics of corrective and preventive jobs attended on the previous day. Without pictures, you never know about what corrective job the presenter is talking about, and the graph of the maintenance breakdown time was exponential. Next morning during presentation, GM and CEO were both pissed, and around 10 a.m. I got a call on my desktop telephone from my manager that from now on, smartphones are allowed for the maintenance team. Yep, it's amazing. You're not allowed to challenge corporate uh, policies. They want to make these decisions on the fly. I guess it makes them feel important and special. And uh, you try to explain to them, you know, this is going to cut your production time or increase your production time and screw up all your numbers and you're going to get more downtime and people are going to be agitated. And yeah, it's just, it's just not good, man. So, all right, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed these stories today. And if you did, would you do me a favor? Click that like button down below. It helps our algorithm out a lot. Subscribe to the channel so we can hit that 10,000 mark. And maybe click that little bell icon so you get notified the next time the fat guy with the beard tells you a story. See ya!